Very nice, Brenda. Thank you. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Well, those of you who were here on the first Sabbath of the month heard part one of Forgiving as I Have Been Forgiven. So today is, guess what? Part two. That's right. If you'll remember from last time, we spoke about the need to forgive. We learned that it was of primary importance to our spiritual life because our Master told us that our Heavenly Father will forgive us only as we forgive each other in the same way. And if we don't forgive others their trespasses against us, he will in likewise not forgive ours. So we learned that it was vital that we learn to forgive as he forgives. And we talked a little bit about how God forgives. We learned that God forgives us totally by his grace, not for self-gain. We learned that God forgave us completely, holding nothing back. We learn that God forgave us even before we asked for forgiveness. We learn that God forgave us on the basis of his son's death. We learn that God's forgiveness is continual. So we learn that in some that God forgives us on the basis of his grace. He forgives us completely before we ask for it. He forgives us, though, with justice. He doesn't sweep it under the rug, but he forgives us continually. And we learn, hopefully, that forgiveness was a change of the heart. A change of the heart both toward the offense itself and the, the offender, the person who offends us. And then the question... I ended with the question, what is that change of attitude? What is that change of attitude that needs to happen in our heart? Well, first we must confess the foundational truth that God is sovereign and he's in control of all things. We read in Romans chapter 8, 28. A verse we're very well familiar with. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God's in control, brethren. If we put our trust in him, if we submit to him, he's in control. And we're not able perhaps to understand how the evil acts of people figure into the all-controlling sovereignty of God. But we know that somehow, in his infinite sovereignty, this means that even when someone sins against us, we must trust that God can turn this to our good and to his glory as we respond to the offense in righteous ways. So the first step in practicing forgiveness is to trust that God is in control, even, in this, even when the situation causes us pain even when we don't understand why perhaps it's happening or he's, God's allowing it. We have to trust and have faith in him. Secondly, we affirm the truth of God's word that he is the one who disciplines and punishes the transgressor. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Romans 12, verse 19. Paul writes to the church of Rome, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. We are not charged with the justice of those who sin against us. That's God's job. And when we try to do that, when we try to repay evil for evil. We're, we're usurping God's role. And that's a dangerous thing to do, brethren. Thus, when someone sins against me, it's not my place to see, 
to it that he is punished or corrected. That's God's place. And if I think that withholding forgiveness will punish the person by making them feel bad, you know, I'm not going to forgive you. You should feel bad. Well, then I've usurped God's place as the avenger. So the second thing I must practice is giving the whole matter to God and letting him deal with it in his way and in his time. And make no mistake, brethren, he will. He will in his time and in his way. That means I give up the notion that I might have that teaching the offender a lesson is my responsibility. It's not really my responsibility. It's God's. And my ability to change the person for the good will come by expressing genuine forgiveness. You may remember the story that Brenda told about the, the woman whose young daughter was killed senselessly by a drunk driver who was only in his early 20s and how she struggled with forgiving him and then came to understand that she had to forgive him because it was eating her up. It was just... She was the one being punished as much as he was, even though he was in prison. And she forgave that young man and to the point that she went to actually visit him and, and he was, his life was changed. His life was changed because of her act of forgiveness. After affirming that God is the one who repays the sinner, Paul goes on in Romans chapter 12, verse 20 to write the following. Romans 12, verse 20. He says there, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Boy, if anything goes against human nature, it's doing good to our enemies. Why, he's still our enemy. He didn't say this is a former enemy. Paul says he's your enemy. He says, if he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. He says, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that meaning, keep heap burning coals upon his head, which is to actually take him from Proverbs, Proverbs 25, 22. It's difficult to understand, and I've heard a lot of explanations for that. One is that when heaping burning coals on his head is that we make him feel bad. You know, that causes him to understand his guilt, and then perhaps he'll repent. Mm, I don't know about that. Obviously, Paul's not suggesting that the greatest revenge comes by being kind to those who've been sinned against us. If our motivation for kindness is revenge in some way, like making them feel bad, then the previous verse loses its entire force. Rather, I think the idea of burning coals has the final judgment in view. In other words, if one is kind to one's enemies, and this does not change them, because we face it, sometimes it won't, brethren. But if it doesn't change them, and they continue to act as our enemy, then one's kindness will stand as yet another witness against them in the final day. When God will judge. When justice will be served. This is ultimately, I think, Paul's point here is that revenge is to be left in God's hands, even if such revenge will not be meted out until the judgment day. Because remember, brethren, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all, he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We must all stand before that judgment seat, brethren. Now those of us in the body of Christ who've had our sins forgiven by our faith in the Redeemer will have it stamped paid. But those who do not will have to answer. And then perhaps they'll see that they need that Savior too. And so that's what the, that's what the second resurrection is all about, brethren. But that's a, a whole other topic. 
Thirdly, forgiveness is a change of attitude toward the offense, and the offender allows one to view the whole situation from an entirely different perspective. You see, once we recognized or, or reckoned with the fact that God is in control, even of every situation, and that he is the one who is responsible to correct and teach the offender, we are able to analyze the offense from a different angle. You, and I think we often overlook this. More often than not, when a person sins against us, it reveals a deeper need in their lives. We don't know what their life has been like. We don't know what caused them to do what they did, what they may have gone through, the things they may have suffered. For instance, a person often engages in gossip or slander because they feel inferior or marginalized. And what made them feel that way? Perhaps they had a father or a mother who constantly degraded them, constantly put them down, made them feel like dirt under their heels. Or perhaps they were bullied in school to the point that their self-worth has been diminished to the point that as a way to cope, they want to make everybody else feel that way. If they think by bringing others down through gossip, they will elevate themselves. But once we have given the situation to God, we are able to view the offense as an indication of the offender's needs and are therefore in a better position, position genuinely to love the person by seeking to meet his or her needs. This is especially true, of course, in, in marriage because unkind words, disrespect, anger, dishonesty, all these are warning signs of something, some much deeper need. And once we're able to change our attitude through applying forgiveness, we can stop and ask the more important question, Why, what does this tell me about the real needs of my spouse? That is a love question. When we love the other person enough to understand that what they did hurt us, but why, why did they do that? And seek to, to fill the need that they may have That's true love. When we're able to stop concerning ourselves with protecting ourselves or getting revenge or teaching the offender a lesson, we are able to seek ways to help heal the wounds that caused the offense in the first place. And isn't that what we're called to do, brethren, to be peacemakers? To be, like our master, healers? Now, we noted that God forgives us not by sweeping our sins under the carpet, by be, but by, by dealing with him in terms of satisfying his own infinite justice. He did this by giving his son, Jesus, as payment for our sins. Thus, the forgiveness that he extends to us cost him quite a bit. We can't even imagine what it cost him what it cost him, what it cost our Messiah. We need to remember that forgiving someone does not mean pretending the offense didn't occur or simply saying we won't talk about it anymore. That is, leaving it unresolved and hoping it will just go away. This is not forgiveness and it will never solve the problem. Like a sliver left, left under your skin, it'll fester and it'll grow until that root of bitterness is planted. And we, we talked about that before, the damage that can do to us. <coughs> no. Jesus teaches us that when the offense occur, we are to be active in resolving the conflict. 
Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse 23. It says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. If you believe you have sinned against somebody, if you have offended somebody, or even if somebody's offended you and it's still unresolved, God says, you go and be reconciled or do what you can to be reconciled before you can offer a gift to me. He's given us that responsibility, brethren. And it's, and it's a serious one, as I said, because God has told us he, will forgives, he forgives our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And so as we, uh, that's why I think this is a, a very appropriate topic as we approach the Passover. When we again will go before, in a sense, God's altar to recommit our lives and to, his, to that covenant. Can we go there with unresolved issues between a brother? Now here, notice this though, brethren. Be reconciled does not mean have your relationship restored. It's great if that happens. And that's what we hope would happen. But let's face it, that's not always in our control. It means, whatever, however, that you do all in your power to right the wrong. Whether or not the person you have sinned against acknowledges it. At the minimum, this means you ask for his or her forgiveness. It means that you engage in restoration of what material things may have been the cause of the offense. It means you do whatever you can to restore the relationship. It's up to the other person to forgive. And if they don't, you've done your part. Or if it's up to you to forgive, and you forgive, like I said, it's not up to you to, to try to seek justice. That's God's job. From the side of the one offended, it means that you willingly forgive and that you accomplish what needs to be done. So forgiveness is devoid of justice, or is not, rather, Forgiveness is not devoid of justice. It depends on it. Only when wrongs have been righted can there be any hope of restoring the relationship. But it is important to realize that when you have done all you can do, ask for forgiveness, restored whatever you're able, you have fulfilled your obligation. If the person refuses to say he or she forgives you, that is their problem, not yours you may return to the altar and offer your gift. And there's one aspect of this characteristic of forgiveness as it pertains to extending forgiveness to a fellow believer, those within the household of faith. We should remember that God has already forgiven that person of his or her sin through the sacrifice of his son. He has declared that person righteous. If God has forgiven all our sins in the Messiah, who are we to withhold forgiveness? Are we greater than God? So a further motivation in forgiving someone who has sinned against us is to remember that God has already forgiven him or her. Moreover, since the death 
of His Son is the final and ultimate basis for forgiveness of sins, we may forgive those who sin against us on the same grounds. If, if the Messiah died to pay the penalty of the very sin enacted against us by someone, then what right, by what right, do we have to hold that offense as though it still needs to be paid? What about forgiving continually as God forgives us, as we established before? Well, one of the hardest things to do, I think, is to continue to forgive someone when they repeatedly sin against us, when they repeatedly hurt us. We begin to think that in forgiving the person, we are simply enabling them to continue in their sin. We're letting them off the hook, so to speak, when we should be holding their feet to the fire by telling them, this is the last time I'm forgiving you for this. If it happens again, forget it. Right? <laughs> but as I've noted above, it's not our place to bring justice upon the head of the one who sinned against, God, against us. That is God's responsibility. Moreover, withholding forgiveness does not change the person who sins against us. It only hardens them. But most importantly, withholding forgiveness opens the way in our own hearts toward bitterness. Again. And bitterness, as we talked about before, leads to hatred, which leads to uh, poison in our, in our very being that eats us up. It doesn't do anything to the person that we have these feelings toward. However, again, I want to stress that forgiveness does not dismiss justice. In the story that Brenda told, uh, told about the, the young woman who forgave the, the young man who drunkenly killed her daughter, she did ask that the judge reduce the sentence. But she did not ask the judge to let him off the hook. She didn't ask for him to be set free. No. You see, God's justice will stand. And he has said that murder is a sin. That's murder whether you pull out a gun and shoot somebody or if you drunkenly kill them in an accident out of negligence. There's still a price to pay. But that's not your concern. Your concern is that you forgive. In the midst of having forgiven them, you remove yourselves from the need to take revenge. And you can still trust God to administer justice in accordance with his own righteousness. That's up to him, how he deals with it. How does this apply in our everyday lives and relationships? Well, it means, brethren, that while we commit ourselves to an understanding practice of forgiveness, we do not negate the need to see justice met. In other words, let's take an example. A wife whose husband is unfaithful should commit herself to forgive him. But even after the engaging in genuine forgiveness, she still has the right, in accordance with God's justice, to seek a divorce. The two things are not mutually exclusive. This highlights the fact that forgiveness and restoration of a broken relationship are not necessarily the same. It's best when relationship can be restored, but sometimes it just can't. It just can't. But that doesn't negate the need for forgiveness, the absolute necessity for forgiveness. Forgiveness may lead to restoration, of, and that, of course, is the best outcome. But as I said, 
Forgiveness is fundamentally a change of the, in the heart of the one who has been offended. That's what it's all about. It's a change of the heart of the forgiver. Restoration is the willingness and the ability to rebuild what has been broken through sin, and this involves both parties. You can't control the other party. All you can control is yourself and how you react. And if the other person is willing to be restored, so much the better. But if not, you still forgive. What are some roadblocks to forgiveness or attitudes of an unforgiving heart? Well, it, right up front, forgiving someone who has hurt us is one of the hardest things we'll ever do. And that's because forgiving is contrary to our own sinful human nature. We want revenge. We want to see the other person pay. We want to see the other person hurt like we hurt. But that's, that's not the way of a godly nature. If we allow our sinful nature to lead the way, we will always find very good reasons why we should withhold forgiveness. Moreover, the enemy of our souls hates forgiveness. Since the battle is not against people, but against the evil powers, as we know from Ephesians 6, verse 12, when we commit ourselves to obey God, we are engaged in a spiritual battle as well. As more true than ever in the area of forgiveness. You see, our enemy knows that his primary foothold in the lives of people is bitterness. Oh, he loves bitterness. That's his ticket to a carnival because then he can fester hatred and at its worst hatred can lead to acts of violence murder even and it's most extreme it eats us up destroys our lives he also knows that exercising the spiritual duty of forgiveness dispels bitterness. So given the opportunity, he will set all manner of roadblocks in the path of someone who is committed to extending forgiveness. What are some of those roadblocks? Well, here's one. I'm trying to forgive, but I just can't forget what he has done to me. As I, as I mentioned, as I uh, spoke to last time, brethren... There is no scriptural requirement to forget in order to forgive. One does not forget what has taken place. One changes their attitude toward the one who has caused the offense. Our master taught this when he gave two parables to his disciples, following Peter's question about how often we should forgive someone who has sinned against us. Remember that was 70 times 7 or an infinite number of times. He brings before him one man who owed... Uh, oh, he, he speaks to the parable of the king who settling accounts with his servants. And he brings uh, before him one man who owed 10,000 talents and demands that he pays the debt. Of course, the, the, man was, the servant was unable to come, with that, up, uh, come up with that amount of money. So his master demands that he, his wife, and his children be sold into slavery to pay the debt. With nothing left to do but beg for mercy, the servant falls to his needs and pleads his cause. And that parable goes on to tell the, that the master felt pity upon the man and forgave his debt and let him go free. And then, free from his burden, the servant went out and found someone who owed him some money, not even close to what he owed his Lord. A small pittance in comparison. But when the man couldn't repay the, the debt, the servant demanded that he be thrown in prison. This turn of events was, of course, reported back to the king, who immediately summoned the unworthy servant reprimanded him and reinstated his debt. 
he sent the unworthy servant to prison and until such time as his debt was fully repaid. So what do we learn from that parable, brethren? Well, we can see that the king forgave the debt initially, but he didn't forget it. And when the servant acted unworthily, the debt was easily reinstated. The same is true of the New Covenant text in Jeremiah 31, 31. We're Jeremiah 31, 31. Here God says regarding the sins of Israel, He says, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now that sounds like he's forgetting it, right? As if God for, could forget. But in this context, the word remember is used in a, co a covenant sense. A better, a better translation might be this, to get the sense of it. I will forgive their sins and no longer credit it to their account. Because obviously, brethren, the all-knowing God cannot forget anything. The point of forgiveness from a divine perspective, from God's perspective, is that the sin are, sins are no longer credited or charged to the account of the sinner. He says, I will remember it no more. He's saying, it's paid. It's done. So remembering the fence should not be a roadblock to forgiving. Rather, forgiveness exists in the willingness to consider the debt, the offense, whatever it is, paid in full. It's a change of attitude toward the offense and the offender. So, we needn't forget to forgive. But that doesn't mean we keep bringing it up every chance we get. Remember what you did to me and I forgave you? Boy, that was really bad. But I forgave you. No, that doesn't, we don't keep beating them over the head. We may not forget it, but we don't use it as a weapon either. That's trying to get revenge again. How about this one? He needs to learn a lesson. He hurt me and I'm not about to forgive him until he understands how much pain he caused. Again, this is revenge at the heart of an unforgiving attitude. But it was, as we've seen, revenge belongs to God, not to us. When our hearts lean toward harboring unforgiveness because we want to even the scales or make the person pay a little with one with the one who has hurt us. We must remember that in doing so, we are usurping God's rightful place as the judge over all the earth. Furthermore, revenge is a single way of describing those things we listed in Ephesians 4.31. Those things like bitterness and, uh, and anger that we needed to put away in order to exercise forgiveness. Revenge is the opposite of love. And Paul teaches us that Love does not take revenge in the famous love verses, uh, love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. In the end, revenge is selfishness. That's all it is, really. Revenge is selfishness. We may try to convince ourselves that revenge is an enactment of justice, but if we attempt to bring, out, bring about justice in unjust ways, we have actually thwarted justice. We should also reckon, brethren, with the fact that if revenge was the way to deal with sin, we would all fall before the wrath of God. Instead, God in His mercy extended forgiveness to us in spite of the fact that we had sinned against Him. If our hearts are attracted to revenge when someone sins against us, it is time to rehearse once again how God forgave us and to, reve to revel in the glory of His love. When we, have for when we have experienced His forgiveness and love afresh, we will be more able to extend forgiveness and love to the one who sins against us. Again, and we should remember, remember, remember that when we take revenge as our duty, we have taken that which rightfully belongs to God. And this, 
can't stress enough, is a very dangerous step. Because thinking we can act in God's place is the very substance of Satan's rebellion from the beginning. Remember? I will assert myself above the clouds. I will. I will do. No. He wanted to be like God. We can't make that same mistake, brethren. A heart set on revenge is a heart governed by bitterness, and bitterness gives way to him, to, to the devil. Whether we begin to plan revenge, we should be awakened to the fact that we're giving in to the very ways of the enemy. How about this roadblock? As soon as he asks for forgiveness, I'll give it to him, and not a second before. This roadblock to forgiveness is founded upon the common misunderstanding of what forgiveness is in the first place. Forgiveness is not something that is earned by one seeking it or wanting, warranted by one's repentance. How do you earn forgiveness? God's forgiveness. When he first forgave you, when he first, first forgave me, I hadn't done anything other than put my faith in his son, I suppose. But that was, even that was a gift of God. No one comes to him, he says, comes to, except the Father draw him, you, him or you, me. No, we didn't do anything to earn repentance. What if the person who sinned against you never asked for your forgiveness? Does that mean you harbor ill feelings against him or her for the rest of your life? Do you let that bitterness grow and fester because he never or she never asked for forgiveness? What good does that do for either you or either you or the one who has sinned against you? It only leaves you harboring an offense and vulnerable to bitterness. Here's where Paul's admonition to forgive just as God forgave us, is very insightful. Just as God forgave us before we ever sought forgiveness, we are able to forgive those who sin against us before they even approach us for forgiveness. Now, we hope they do. And that can lead then to perhaps a restoration of relationship. That's what God wants, why he wants us to repent to ask for forgiveness so that we can have that relationship with him completely restored. Remember, forgiveness means, number one, believing that God is in control of every situation, meaning that he has the ability to take your current situation and turn it to his glory and your good. Two, Confessing that God is the one who's in charge of the person who has sins against you and he is the one who will administer discipline or punishment and teach the person what he or she needs to learn. And three, the offense against you can be used to understand the deeper issues and problems of the offender, giving you the ability to love them in genuine ways. That's how you can love your enemies. These steps to forgiveness, which are really nothing more then agreeing with God and acting on what he said can be done well before the offender ever asks for your forgiveness. You can do those. You don't need to wait till they come. In fact, you can do them. You should be doing them. The sooner we can move toward forgiveness, the better. We should not leave any time for bitterness to grow or to take root. When someone sins against you begin the process of forgiveness as soon as you as soon as it happens then if and then if and when the person comes to seek your forgiveness you'll be fully ready and able to act without and and offer it without reservation how about this roadblock here's another one 
He's not sincere when he asks me to forgive him. The reason I know is that he's done this before and I think he'll probably do it again. He's just taking advantage of my kindness. As I pointed out last time, uh, the Messiah teaches us that we are to keep on forgiving regardless of how many times someone sins against us. So the choice is not whether I should forgive or not, but whether I will obey or not. Because face it, that's what he said. You are to forgive 70 times 7. Meaning an infinite number, not 490. The idea that if I hold forgiveness from someone who continues to sin against me will rectify the situation is wrong-headed. Withholding forgiveness is itself a sin, and one cannot overcome sin with sin. Let me say that again. Withholding sin is, forgiveness is a sin. And you can't overcome sin with sin. Once again, this roadblock stems from a misunderstanding of what forgiveness is in the first place. Forgiveness, again, I'll say it again, is a change of the attitude on the part of the one who's been offended. It's a change of the heart of the one who's been offended. Its primary effect is not on the one who's caused the offense, but upon the heart of the one offended. Forgiving frees the heart to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. That's from Luke 6, verse 27. In other words, forgiveness frees a person to follow in the footsteps of the Messiah. So, let's say we've committed ourselves to exercising forgiveness. What can we expect? Well, I wish it were possible to promise that when we commit ourselves to forgive those who hurt us, we will always experience happiness and success without trials. All will be well. But we all know that's not the case in this fallen world. If we do follow in the footsteps of Jesus and love those who hurt us as he commanded, what we can expect is that there will be some measure of suffering. He forgave and he suffered. He told us that we will suffer as well. Forgiveness is an act of love, and love means giving oneself away. That too is contrary to our nature, and that means we will have to die to self in order to forgive. <coughs> But what we can expect from the outcome of exercising forgiveness toward those who offend us? Well, first, may, people may consider us weak, and they think they can take advantage of us all the more. We may be diminished in the eyes of some because we are not willing to slander the one who has sinned against us because we've already forgiven that person. But our strength, brethren, isn't what, in what people think of us. As the psalmist said, what can man do to me that I should fear him? No, our strength is in the Lord. We leave the outcome of obeying him in his hands. Second, we may be slandered. People who are bent to revenge and bitterness will consider our willingness to forgive as a character flaw, an inability to stand up for our rights. This may be particularly the case in our workplaces where slander and revenge is a common stock and trade. I've worked in places like that where everybody was trying to stab the other person in the back. Fortunately now, it's not the case where I work, but I've been in those situations. It's a sorry place to be. Third and most importantly, we should expect success in our lives. We should, accept, uh, we should expect success in our lives because God promises to bless those who obey him. So though we may go through some the aforementioned 
trials, God promises to bless those who obey him. And, and let me stress it again. Forgiveness is first and foremost a matter of obedience to our, ma to our maker. A forgiving heart is one that is at rest with God and with self. And self-contentment is a rare pleasure and should be highly prized. Being able to go to sleep at night, knowing there is no bitterness or revenge harboring in your heart, eating you alive, keeping you awake with plans of revenge, is a great delight. Moreover, obeying God by forgiving those who sin against us keeps our hearts before the Almighty. Withholding forgiveness means our heart or means harboring sin in our hearts. Because I said, like I said, withholding forgiveness, brethren, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's a sin. The bitterness that an unforgiving heart nurtures is a cancer and will eventually affect one's entire outlook and perspective on life. Practicing forgiveness therefore frees the heart to true worship a joyful spirit, and the ability to enjoy all the good things that God has given us. Finally, a person who knows how to forgive is a vessel fit for the master's use. He's not self-consumed with the way others have hurt him because he has placed his situations in the hands of God Almighty and is content to leave them there. He is not constantly burdened with the offenses of others and is therefore able to bear the burdens of others. And when you're not, when you're not worried about being burdened with others' offenses against you, then you can help bear another person's burden. And when you do that, you fulfill the entire law of God. I'm going to leave you with chap Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, verse 2. Remembering that when we rid ourselves of the burden of unforgiveness, we're able to bear one another's burdens. And it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Bear one another's burdens and, there, and thereby fulfill the Lord, law of Christ. Brethren, as we approach the Passover, I hope we can truly see how important the topic of forgiveness is. And if there is any unforgiveness in our heart, if there is anything that we need to forgive, whether it be a brother in the church or someone outside. Before we go to take the Passover, brethren, let us forgive.